the the main reason I left the reform tradition, the main reason, is there a main reason? I don't know. A, a lot of reasons. Um, I, I felt dissatisfied with a lot of things in the, in the reformed world. I think there's a lot of good there. Um, what I liked about the Reformed tradition is it was a very theologically rich tradition. These are people that are thinking deeply about what they believe, thinking deeply about what Scripture teaches, and are very concerned about it and, and want to know. Uh, and as someone who has always had a lot of questions, someone who's always been more kind of academically minded, um, that was very appealing to me. Um, I had a background in a Reformed tradition. I was baptized at a Reformed church. Um, but I wasn't super into theology. But when I got into theology, when I was in high school, it was very attractive because it answered a lot of the questions that I had as I was uh, starting to really think intellectually through my faith. And uh, Reformed theology provided a lot of that, and I'm, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but as I began to study a lot of the, uh, the the church fathers and some of the early church writers, um, it kind of made me re rethink a lot of issues. And some of those were the sacraments, um, you know, baptism, the Lord's Supper, um, exactly how those things work out, as well as worship, uh, as well as the idea of a necessary, divinely ordained Presbyterian structure of church government. Because I found a few things. One is that, because when you look in the early church, it, and I never came to the conclusion that the early church is right on everything. you got to do everything that the church fathers did, or there's one church father we got to follow. I, I'm fine saying that, you know, the fathers got this wrong, the fathers got that wrong. But, but I think that looking at the fathers can help us rethink things. Because when you look at someone from another age, they're going to think with different presuppositions than you do. They're going to think from a different worldview than you do. And they'll cause you to look back at the text in a way that maybe you haven't looked at it before. So I think it's a, it's it's important for that reason. So I wasn't one that was willing to say, ooh, everything the, the church father said is, is right. So I'm just going to believe whatever is closest to the fathers. I, that, that was never really what, what I was going for. Um, and, and to be honest, the more I've read, I, I'm not convinced that there is a tradition that teaches just like the fathers. I know Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox always claim those kind of things. But, you know, I I, I don't see things like, you know, the full-blown Marian dogmas. And I don't see, um, you know, the papacy. I, they're just not there. Okay. They're, they're not there. And yes, you could find occasional fathers who have certain ideas that are very Roman Catholic. You could find the presence of prayers to saints very early. You can't. I mean, they're there. Um <laughs> Look at the 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 situation of the early church, though, and then compare that to the medieval prayers to the saints. I mean, it's completely – it's not even in the same realm at all. Um, it, it's totally different uh, in terms of the extensiveness of it, the idolatry of it, um, the prominence of it. Um, I mean, if you read the church fathers, you know, read Chrysostom and read his sermons. I mean, he's just exegeting through books of the Bible, and he sounds a lot of times more like – a Protestant preacher in the way that he's just going through the text, examining it, explaining it. It doesn't mean at every point. Sure, he's very much, you know, a church father. So on certain works or certain ideas, you know, he talks about penance, for example, in a, in a way, or almsgiving is what he, he doesn't really refer to it as penance, uh, as a way that God forgives sins. Okay, that's definitely not Protestant. But, but the point is you find all sorts of stuff there. Certain ideas seem more Protestant, certain seem more Catholic, certain seem, seem more Eastern Orthodox. you got a blend of ideas, okay? But, but the point is this, that when I started reading the, the Church Fathers, I started realizing that there's a couple, no matter how they disagree on various things, I don't see any of them disagreeing with baptismal regeneration. I see debates on a lot of things. I see different views on certain things, different nuances on certain things. But that's not even a question. It's just there. I mean, everywhere. Universally, as, as early as, as we have writings that mention baptism, it's just an assumption. So that made me really question. And then as I read the Middle Ages, hey, they all believe that too. What makes me think that they all got the Bible wrong? And then as I read the passages, after reading the Fathers, I'm like, wait a minute. This is just what they say. Uh, maybe they were all right, and we've been getting it wrong. Um, and, and I recognize, too, that there are the Reformed that have you know higher views of baptism as, as well. I, I will admit that my Reformed background was more I, – um, I, I read a lot of Charles Hodge, uh, the Princeton guys, um, which are very low sacramental. Uh, theologians, B.B. Warfield, Charles Hodge, uh, people like that. So, um, and his systematics was one I loved. I read it all the time. I've read it multiple times. Um, so I wasn't part of a very, a more sacramental reformed mindset. I, just, I wasn't. And, and so I'll be, I'll be honest with that um, when I've, uh, when I, when I was part of it. It was more of the Princeton, you know, everything is kind of just symbolic. There's really nothing, nothing beyond that. But, but the other question then was, you know, the church government was a big one. And that's one I haven't talked about as much. Um, and the question was just, we have bishops right away. I mean, John dies 
and we've got bishops. Like they're there. I don't think they're universal yet. But the question was, has the church really been sinning in the way it's been structured for its entire existence? I mean, the Apostle John dies. Presbyterian government doesn't exist. People can make an argument for it in the New Testament. Immediately after the New Testament, it's just not there. Um, and yeah, I know you can make arguments that there was a form of that maybe in, um, you know, First Clement. But for the most part, the earliest writings, they just have bishops. If there was really a strict form of church government that the apostles said, you got to have this, this is the only way it's run, would the immediate followers like, you know, Ignatius, who's so invested in bishops and obedience to the bishop, just not know that? I really struggled with that. And it made me kind of rethink, you know, reading the New Testament and asking the questions of, well, is there really a strict church government that's been set up that you have to do X, Y, and Z? Um, so that, that was a big question for me. Um, dealing with the issue of perseverance, when I began studying that, there are so many texts to teach you can fall away from the faith. And, and I just really found myself, after a while, just so hard trying to explain away the meaning of the text. Um, limited atonement was another one. Um, while I think initially the arguments for limited atonement are very strong, when you actually look into those arguments further, when you look into the responses to the Arminian verses and you look into them further, you just kind of see they don't really hold up. They sound strong at first glance. They look strong at first glance. But when you really dive into them, they fall apart pretty quickly. Okay, so that's that's where I come from there. All right, so those are some of the reasons. There's a lot of reasons. Um, I, th I mean, th those are the theological reasons. I'm not getting into the existential reasons. Um, there are a lot of those struggling with assurance. The reason I don't want to get into the existential reasons is this. I, I see people come to all sorts of theological conclusions and when they're telling their story about how they how they get there, it's, I struggled with this and this made me feel better. Um, and I used to kind of tell my, my story in those terms, but I realize I don't care what made you feel better. I care about what's true. Now, as a pastor, of course I do. You know, as a pastor in my congregation, you know, that's my concern, spiritual spiritually helping these people, law and gospel, their their crises on all of this. And I think that Lutheran theology gives the proper answer to those crises. And, and to be honest, I don't know how I'd be a pastor without being a Lutheran. I don't know how I would do law and, you know, without strong law and gospel ministry, I don't know how you handle crises in a church. I really don't. Um, but I never want to focus there when I'm doing my theological content because I never want to give the impression that um, I believe this because I had an existential struggle and this made me feel the best. Because I've seen that so many times. And that's what I find with, well, kind of the whole radical grace movement with Tully and Chavidjian and, and others, um, is that there's just this such a focus on, I felt this, this made me feel better. And, and while that's important to deal with people's feelings, you don't ignore that. Of course you don't. Um, but in terms of theologically what's true, that's not really what determines what's true. So I don't want to focus on those things. And you probably noticed that in my limited atonement debate, I kind of ignored the question of what are the practical things? I said, ah, I don't care. Let's look into what scripture says. Um, just because I think that's really the, uh, the, the more important thing to look at.